Hey, welcome to Abide Church Online. I'm so excited that you've joined us today. I pray that today's message encourages you. I pray that it challenges you to grow in your walk with God. And as we like to say around here, we pray that it helps you live, love, and look more like Jesus in everything that you do. Uh, Hey, today, if you have a prayer request or if you want to support this ministry financially, you can do that at our website, right at abidechurch.com. Now, let's get to the message. Well, if you haven't met me, my name's Dave Woodrich, and uh, I just wanted to do a real quick introduction of my family. Uh, This is my wife, Ashley, over here, if you raise your hand. And these are all my children. And it sounds like a title to a soap opera, but it's not. It's more like the Brady Bunch. So uh, when Pastor Dan asked me to speak, I don't even know if he realized that this stage is pretty special to us. And um, not only is it we love this church, but two years ago, we got married on this stage. And we have a unique story where God brought us together. Both of our families suffered loss of our spouses, and uh, that was not an easy time to go through. And there was a a time when neither one of us thought, we didn't know where we were going with the future. But I can just tell you this, that God is able to do more than you could ever ask or think. And to stand on this stage is pretty special to me because this is kind of where our journey started. And so we knew when we met that God had stuff in store for us. We both had the same desires to, we knew life was short. That woke us up and realized that the kingdom is what is important. People's needs are is what important. So um, I just wanted to share that a little bit of our background and, and give that introduction. So the title of my message is Discovering the I in Team. And you probably grew up wondering, there's no I in team, and that is true, but that's with a selfish I. But the I in team is good when it benefits the team. I loved football my whole life, and when I finally got an opportunity to play football in high school, I had to make a decision. What am I willing to do? What am I willing to do? And that's the kind of I we're talking about with this team, okay? Um, my football team, the first year I started, didn't do very well. And I noticed that we didn't really know each other. We didn't really do anything together. But over the summer before the, my senior year, we decided to get together, started having unity. We hung out together. We trained together. We practiced together. We ate together. And that senior year, we had a winning season. So that's what I'm talking about, team. I like football. I know my wife loves football. But if you know her, that is a statement of faith that she loves football. I'm speaking that. But I love football, and that's kind of why I I tailored this around team, okay? And I I just feel like there's so many different positions on a team, and it's like you might feel, I don't know what position you're on, but it doesn't matter. We all win. We all win when we do our part. And that's the I I'm talking about. So... uh, when I had the high school gym and everybody in there was training for football. The whole thing was dedicated to football. It's like everybody that went in there was building strength and muscle for football. I don't see that in gyms today. I see a lot of mirrors, okay? I I don't know if you go, I don't go to gyms, obviously you can tell, Uh, but there's a lot of mirrors in gym. And I'm thinking, what are they building their muscle for? Do they ever go out and do anything with it, or is it just to look good? And I, I almost see that kind of in the church today. I really do. We get in here, because what is a church for? It's to edify and build us up, build strength. But if you don't get outside the walls of the gym and do anything with your strength, it's really just about me. It's about I. And inside the church, it's great. I know we don't see mirrors, and I'm not talking about this church because I know this is a great church, and we don't do that here. But I'm telling you, it's when we get built up, we go outside the walls. We go outside the walls of the church, and we start using that strength and that muscle. It's not just to build up muscle, just to push our lawn more and look good when we do it. 
It's going out into our neighborhoods. It's going out into our, our coworkers and our, our workplaces and our, all the fields of, of, of this whole world. It goes beyond the walls. So a couple of points, there's three things that I want to talk about. Um, but first, let me just read a scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 3. It says, in the last days, there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves. They will be unloving and unforgiving. These are three points that I want to kind of talk about today and what Jesus says about that. You know, what we see is the world doesn't really know any better. So what do they do? What do they do? It's this all the time. You know, it's about self. I mean, between phones and social media, have you ever even thought that a mall would really cater to self? Even the, the malls are at fault. Everything you do, you go in there and it's all about, about how I look, how I look, how I look. And so what I, these, these points I'm trying to cover, it seems optional in our life. But I'm just going to tell you, they're foundational. They're not optional. This is what Jesus said. I'm going to start off with the first point is a team with unity is stronger. So when Jesus, right before he was arrested, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in his third prayer before he was arrested. John 17, 23, he said, May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Of all the things that I would have been praying about, wouldn't have been worried about you. But this is the love that Jesus has for us. Of all the things that he could have prayed about, he prayed for perfect unity. And the whole point behind it was that the world would see. In 1 Corinthians 12, Verse 12, it says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Okay, the body of Christ is our team. This is it. This is our team. And we got to come to the, play, the place where we, what is our position on the team? Everybody's got different players. You know, there's different positions, but you got to find what you are called to do. You're still on the team. And you can't sit on the sideline. You can't sit in the bleachers and say, I'm part of it. You can't. I don't care how good you are, how bad you are. If you make mistakes, get on the field. Get better. Okay? Verse 22, it says, in fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary. This is the discovering the I in our team here. How do you see myself on my team. Am I a toe? Am I an elbow in the body of Christ? I don't know. I got some looks over here just now, but do you know that toes provide balance? You couldn't even walk or run without toes. Moving forward, you need toes if you're going to do it right. What if you're an elbow? I got, I got kids that play sports. There's no way they could golf, play basketball, wrestle. They couldn't do it without an elbow. Because no matter how talented your hands are, whether you're a musician or whether you write or whether you play, whether you work, you can't do anything without an elbow. So every part is important. Every part. So sometimes we feel like we're, we're just, we're, we're the least. We're insignificant but we are vital to the body of Christ. Last week, unfortunately, you can see my son. He's in a wheelchair. Saturday night, I took him to the ER. He broke his, his shin. And he was a cross-country runner, was for this season. But he went from running to barely moving. And that showed you right there that the shin is very important. That's how we are in the body of Christ. When we're not all just doing our part, it slows the body down. Jesus, that's why Jesus said he wants us to be in perfect unity. There was a tag to that, so the world will see. The whole point is to breach the world. The whole great commission, let me, let me, let me say this, co-mission. 
It's not just him going out and doing something and then you're like, ha, ha, ha. No, it's co-mission. We got to get off the pew. We got to get off the chair, get outside the walls, use the strength that we have, know who we are, and provide that. Verse 26, it says, if one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all parts are honored. Let me ask you a question. When someone has a crisis in their life or a moral failure, do you run from them? Do you ignore them? Do you ever go and help them or do we just criticize them? People in the body of Christ are going to make mistakes. They're going to have situations that, that hit them, whether it's their fault or not. I know we're living testimonies that things hit us throughout our life. What about when people succeed? What about when people are honored? What do you do? Do you get jealous? Do you get envious? Or are you glad with them? Galatians 6, 2. It says, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The Greek word for burden is a weight that is heavy or crushing. That crushing weight can, that can be in your finances. It could be in marriages. It could be a rebellious children, children that are running from God. It could be friendships, problems at work. Maybe it's a sickness or even a death of a loved one. Those are all crushing weights. I know when Ashley and I, we lost our spouses a few years ago, and it was a crushing weight to us and our family. Honestly, we didn't know how we were going to make it. We had no idea how to do that alone. It was so unbearable at times, and I'm sure that there's so many different things that you could relate that to, but for us, it was that. And if it wasn't for locking arms with people, if it wasn't for having a body of Christ being there for us, we couldn't have done it. That's a crushing weight that one person can't hold up. Okay, so I'm going to do something real quick. I got this prop. Everybody like props? Okay. This is cool, right? Okay, so this is just cardboard, flimsy cardboard, right? I don't, let me see if, no, that's not going to hold me up. I don't care if you put them all right beside each other, they're not going to hold me up. I don't care how many stand beside each other, they're just not going to stand on their own. And I know some of you can't see that, but they're not going to, they're not going to get up underneath me and hold my weight. I brought another one that's still together. Now check this out. Is it just one type of person? Or is it many different types of gifts that people can come together with? There's a whole bunch of different people that's gone through a lot of different things. And you can see that when they lock arms together, it holds my weight. But individually, it's flexible and, and flimsy and weak. But when we lock arms together, that's that crushing weight that we're talking about. That's that burden that we can't hold up by our own. There's no way we could have made it without the body. Pastor Dan and I were having coffee last week, and we, we were talking about our story. And you know, like, meal trains are great. Love them. You need them. But Pastor Dan said something about unity. He said, you know what? Meal trains feed your body daily, your physical body. But unity brings spiritual strength for the long haul. And I was just like, yes, amen. Because I've been through it and I know the long haul, that's, that's tough. When you go through something and it's not happening right away and you're spending a couple of years on something, it wears you down. And without unity, it just doesn't happen. Hebrews 10, 
24 and 25. It says, let us consider how we spur one another on towards love and good deeds and not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, it's, it's not hard to see people nowadays, and I've been guilty of this too. You don't want to meet together. You don't want to go to church. I've seen this scripture many times. Forsake not the assembling. That was our excuse to go to church. But then people are like, but why? They lose interest. They don't want to go. Why? Because they're not getting encouraged. It's not from the pastor. The pastor is doing everything they can. But you know what? It goes beyond that. It's locking together. It says right here, spur one another on towards love. That's each other. The pastor can only do so much and build you up and edify you. But if you're not locking arms with people and you're not encouraging one another, that's showing the whole unity in the church right there. Point number two is, is it takes love to build unity. Do you know love is the ligaments to the body parts? Can you imagine having a body with just parts laying around, no ligaments? Without love, you don't have the body connected. Ligaments is what holds it together. That's the only thing that was pretty much holding my son's leg together last week. Thank God for ligaments. But what I'm saying is, is love is what builds the unity. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said, Now I'm giving you a new commandment. This is where I said it's not optional. This is his command. This is foundational, to love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. There it is, proven to the world. When we love each other, we get in unity. The world sees it. So here's the discovering I in that. How do we love each other? How? There's, there's a lot of question on, on how we love people. Sometimes we think we want to choose love, but love's not necessarily a choice. It's what you do. Choosing love, what kind of love is that? It's the highest love. You know, I've seen, I've seen churches not having unity, not loving each other. And these are churches. We were in England a few months back, and we saw churches that weren't even in the same denomination come together. And they met, and they do this monthly. They're not worried about the division of the church and what you got going and what I got going. They're coming together for one common goal, to have unity and love each other. And we saw miracles take place. And this is just a monthly thing. We saw that taking place. We saw people getting saved, people getting healed, and just the love between the people. We brought that back was like, oh, I want that. I want that. I know you guys have seen that. When we were in Romania together, we saw churches of different denominations come together to do one common goal. That's what Jesus was talking about. Unity can start and love can start in your home and your family, but it goes beyond that. It gets into the local church. And when we start seeing churches uniting with each other, the world's going to see it. Have you ever been around some, a household that people argue, a family that argues? You ever been around a couple that argues? You don't want to go out to dinner with them. They're like uncomfortable. That's how the world sees the church when we're arguing with each other. We see things happening all the time, and we're arguing about the little things instead of agreeing on the fact that Jesus died for our sins, and we don't have to be separated from him for eternity. He's given us eternal life. That's something to say, hey, I love you, man. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to spend eternity with each other. So get used to it now. But we don't. We argue, and the world sees it. 
and we're expecting to go out there and preach Jesus to the world, and they're saying, do I really want that? Do I really want that? we got to be different. Mark 12, verse 30 to 31. Jesus, once again, said, You are to love Yahweh, your God, with a passionate heart, from the depths of your soul, with every thought, and with all of your strength. This is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is this, that you must love your neighbor in the same way you love yourself. You will never find a greater commandment than these. We've heard that our whole life. But what is loving your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? That's referring to the believer. That's, he's showing unity right there. How do we love ourselves? We're not being in love with ourselves. You know, we got a love-hate relationship going on with ourselves sometimes, I, I noticed. We don't like ourselves, but yet that's all we do is we take selfies and it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about me, 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 me. It's that I and team, the wrong kind of I. But Jesus didn't say, love yourself like that. You got to love yourself the way he loves you. You got to take this and say, this is not how I love myself. Put it down and say, how does God love me? How does he see me? Who am I in the, in the eyes of Jesus? That's how you love yourself. And when you can do that, then you can love your neighbor. When you can love yourself properly and scripturally and appropriately, then you can love your neighbor. Galatians 5.22 in 23, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Love is spirit-given and spirit-driven. It's not something that we put on. So often we try to choose love and we try to do things with love that we think, Oh, I'm, I'm going to love you. I just choose to love you because somebody gets on your nerves and then it doesn't last. Why do you think that doesn't last? Because you're putting it on. It's not coming from within. It's something you're hanging on the outside and it's fleeting. And when somebody really gets the best of you, it falls off, doesn't it? I've been there. You know what the difference between a Christmas tree and a fruit tree is? Roots. So often we're not rooted. We're not rooted in love because we're not rooted in the Lord. The name of this church is abide. And what does it say in John 15? It says, as you abide in me and my words abide in you. We got to be rooted in order for the, the fruit of the spirit to be evident, to show up in our life. These are the words. These are the words of Jesus to love each other. These are not Dave's words. These are Jesus's words. We've got Christmas trees in our home. We've got multiple Christmas trees because we're a blended family, so we've got blended trees. We've got a big one in our entryway, and it doesn't have any roots. It's just sitting there. Looks pretty on the outside. And then we've got one that's way back, back, back in the den, over in the corner, behind furniture. And I noticed something. Which one of those two trees do you think the ornaments fall off? The one in the entryway because that's where everybody goes. It's by the staircase, by the front door. It's where the most traffic goes back and forth. What about the one that's in the, in the corner back in the den? Do you think those ornaments fall off? No. Why? Because it's isolated. You can't isolate yourself. Isolation is a tool of the enemy. But when you put yourself out in front of people, it's a litmus test to find out if that love, that fruit of the spirit will really hang on. And if you're trying to put it on, it's not going to happen. You know what happens when, <laughs> in our house, it's a tile floor and everybody goes barefoot. And you know what happens when an ornament falls off in our house? Everybody back up, get the broom. It's going to hurt somebody. Because we got the glass ornaments and they don't just bounce. They break. But you know what happens when we try to put on love 
and it doesn't last, it doesn't, it doesn't stick. It has the potential to injure people. The fruit, if it was rooted, wouldn't come off until it's time. Because I don't care how many times you rattle that tree, it's not going to come off until it's time. And guess what happens if that, that fruit falls off? It's ready to nourish someone. And it'll plant seed. It'll plant the seeds of love. When you love someone, godly love, that fruit will fall off. And it'll, it'll put seeds into someone else's life. And don't get discouraged. If you're, you're out there loving on somebody and it's godly love, and they get discouraged because they don't love you back. Well, it's un first of all, it's unconditional love. It's, the only, it's agape love. It's the only love that's not conditional. And you can't sit there and wait it out and say, oh, it's not happening, so I'm going to stop loving. No, you give it time, just like you would give any seed time to grow. Be patient and let that seed grow in someone that you're trying to love, that you're trying to plant seeds of love in. Now, you may have a real tree in your Christmas, your Christmas tree, but it's still not rooted. And that's sometimes that's the body. We think we're real, but we don't have any roots. And what happens? It dries up, turns brown, and gets flammable. <laughs> We've got to get rid of it. Can't even put it in the attic. It's all about being rooted. The Holy Spirit is what drives and gives that love for us. We've got to walk in love. So love produces forgiveness. And I've often wondered when I grew up, I was like, why is forgiveness not in the fruit of the Spirit? And it's like, because love produces forgiveness. When you truly love, it produces it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 5 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand in its own way. It is not irritable. And here's what I want you to see. It keeps no record of being wronged. There's your forgiveness right there. It keeps no record. True godly love releases wrongs. It doesn't keep a record. When Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, he said in Matthew 6, 12, he says, and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. It's interesting how he made that a financial term, debt. You know who keeps records? Debt collectors. And they'll remind you of it, won't they? <laughs> Anybody that's ever had a loan and you don't pay it, they're going to remind you. So you got to ask yourself about the discovering I and T. Are we debt collectors? Do we keep holding records of wrongs in us that's been done to us? How about ourselves? Have we done something that we're holding records on on ourselves? You know, I've been involved with prison ministry for a few years. And one of the biggest things that we deal with in that type of ministry is forgiving yourself. But you know what? It doesn't take bars. It doesn't take offense to not forgive yourself. Because we've all done something, something that we can't live with. In Mark 11, 23 and 25. This is, this is so powerful because this, this is a verse that we have heard. If you've been in the church a while, you've heard this verse. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. And it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and not doubt in your heart. I tell you that you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you received it, 
it will be yours. And most of the time, we stop right there. That's it. We think we can just say it and believe it, and that's true. It happens, but we forget the I. The discovering the I in that is this, verse 25. It says, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. So your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Here's the, something that's foundational is that you want God to forgive you, but you're not willing to forgive someone else. You're holding on. Whether he was teaching you about the Lord's Prayer or in Matthew 18 where he talked about the unmerciful servant, and I encourage you to go read that. Matthew 18, 21. It's not in my notes, but there's so much in the word about forgiving so you can be forgiven. And here he is when he's just teaching you how to have faith and to move mountains, to speak unto something, to believe in something. And yet he puts a tag on there to say, but first, when you pray, you forgive. So often we are holding grudges all the time. And if you would just examine yourself and realize how, you, we don't let go. Every time we take communion, we're always talking about examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself. Every day presents a new opportunity for unforgiveness. And I'm telling you, you might be like that tree sitting over in the corner and nothing seems to be bothering you because you're not pressured. You're not rattled. You're not shaken. The wind or the air does not bother you. Your ornament stays on, but you're still not rooted. But if you were put under pressure and you were, you were attacked with something from the enemy or someone that the enemy is using, that's, that's when the pressure hits. And you got a mountain all of a sudden. We all have mountains in our life. And there might be some of you that have many mountains. And you know what those mountains do? They hold you from moving forward because it's hard to climb over and it's hard to get around. And Jesus said that you could say and believe to move it and throw it into the sea. And you don't have to worry about it again. But guess what? When you pray, first, forgive. I know I've held things about different people in my life, relationships in my life, and it has held me up for years until I had to let it go. And there's things that I've done in my life that I harbored and I harbored and I harbored and I had to let it go. I had to forgive myself and say, you know what? God's not holding this against you. Why are you? You know, Jesus said, servant's no greater than his master. And if he can forgive you, then why don't you? You think you're better? You're not. It's a commandment. It's a foundation. It's not optional. We want things to move in our life. The mountains will go when the grudges go. The mountains will go when the grudges go. I want everybody to say that real quick. The mountains will go when the grudges go. How many mountains do you have in your life that you want to get rid of? You know, banks won't remind you, or they won't remind you if they forgive your debt. Guess what? They feel the impact of the loss of the finances in their institution. They feel that. They see it. But they're not reminding you. Somebody might have done wrong to you. You might have done wrong to yourself, and you may feel it for a long time. But if you want that mountain, that feeling of, of what they did to you to go, you got to forgive. It's the releasing of that debt and then saying, I'm not going to remind you anymore. And guess what? I'm not going to remind myself. We got to stop being debt collectors to people and ourselves and say, I'm done. I release that. And you may think, I'm not reminding anybody. But how does your actions, when you get around someone that did something to you years ago, do you avoid them? Do you give them a weird look? Or maybe you don't look at them at all. Maybe you don't talk to them anymore. Maybe you don't text them or call them. Maybe you don't invite them over anymore. That's reminding them. 
just ignoring them, just isolating yourself is a reminder. Let me just close. I just want you to know that we, we're here as a family in this Abide Church. We have a prayer team. We have a whole A team in the Abide that loves you. And it's not because it's put on love. I have seen it. I have listened to it. I have talked. I've, I've been around these guys. They love you. And today I just want to invite you. And whatever God's tugging on your heart, whatever He reminds Whatever's gone through your heart or your mind today, it's today, it's time. We talked about unity, we talked about love, and we talked about forgiveness. You want to take a step of faith towards unity? Come down for prayer. We want to bond together. We want to lock arms together with you. Don't try to do this yourself. You can't. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, what good is it if a man falls and can't get back up and doesn't have anybody to help him? Two are better than one. You can't isolate yourself. You can't be that tree in the background that it's like, I, I look fine. There's no pressure. But you know what? Jesus said in this life, there will be trials and there will be tribulation. But be, he said, be at peace because I've overcome the world. So when we put ourselves in Jesus, we abide in Jesus and we do what he says. We can get past and get through that. Things sometimes don't change in this earth. This is a fallen world, man. But he's given us the power to go through it. And he's given us the instruction in his prayer that we would be one, that we would have perfect unity. Take a step of faith today that if you need healing in your life, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, or even spiritual, I ask you to come down and take a step of faith and unite with us. You might need prayer for unforgiveness. You might need prayer to how to love better, how to walk better. I'm just going to close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word today. We thank you for your love for us, that everything you did was for love. You love us so much that you don't want us to just struggle. You want us to run. You don't want us to just barely just move. You want to bless us through every aspect of our life. You've given us a body of Christ. You've given us the body, the team, and we can win, Lord. You've given us love. You've given us the opportunity to forgive, and you've forgiven us. I just thank you that the seed that was planted in these hearts today will not be stolen that it will be fruitful in the name of Jesus. I thank you for that in Jesus' name.